I'm Lisa Petrides, and I'm going to start off, I'm going to actually time myself here. So um, we're going to speak for 10 minutes each. We have just an hour before lunch, so um, we'll, we'll have very little time for questions, but uh, hopefully that's what we can use our, our lunch time for. So our session is about shifting from subject-centered to student-centered education. And I wanted to um, take a moment just to talk about how we know that every student deserves a highly effective, engaging, and equitable education. And from the session before, I would add everything in there that they said to critical thinking, empathetic. Those are the things that we really need to um, reach their full potential. And I want to talk a little bit about my work in open educational resources but I want to just set up sort of, my talk is going to sort of set up the panel, the rest of the speakers, as well as tell you a little bit more about my work. So as we move from this subject-centered to a student-centered um, mode of education, you know, I think, again, we've already heard so much of this in the last two days, but we're moving from subject-based to interdisciplinary, a standardized teaching to competency-based learning. And I'll give just a couple of quick examples about each of these. Um, you know, one size fits all to personalized learning and proprietary curriculum to open educational resources. You heard this morning somebody talk from Austria about that example too. So competency-based education uh, is uh, probably the best living example of this is what we see in Finland today. But this is, this is something that's really growing uh, in the United States but in other countries as well where we're really focusing on what is the outcome and then how what is it, how you teach to get to that outcome is personalized and adaptive. It's not prescriptive. That's the, that's the concept between competency-based education. Uh, in terms of examples of personalized learning, uh, we talk about the, um, the, the, adapt the adaptability of resources, empowering students, and keeping them engaged. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about each of these, and I'm hoping our slide will be available afterwards too, after the meeting. I haven't, I haven't, I don't know if anybody has confirmed that, um, but that would be a, a great way to be able to share with the limited time that we have. I want to talk about open educational resources because I think this is this is more than just a thing. It's really an approach, and in some ways, as during the last panel, I kept thinking, how do we take what we learn from there, and how do we develop it into curriculum? Because I'm really thinking about the pragmatic level and what that could look like. Uh, and so, for those of you who don't know, open educational resources—they're really about um, teaching and learning resources that are free and available to anyone, and they're published in a way that allows their distribution, it allows their adaptation, it allows the personalization. So it isn't about, we're trying to move away from this very prescriptive textbook model of education. And if we think about, again, what we just saw in the last panel, these are many ideas that we don't find in traditional textbooks. Uh, and for those of you who were here uh, the first night of the event, you know, I, in my talk there, I, I talked about how just in the United States alone, and I wish I had some international numbers, we'll get those soon, but it, just in the, in the United States alone, from the K-12 education, primary and secondary, that's an $8 billion a year market. That's not just a one-time investment, that's every single year. And if we multiplied it by every country of people who are here, we can see that there's actually not a scarcity of resources, there's an abundance of resources that could be reallocated in this way uh, to, to think about what OER really affords. So specifically, and I'll give a couple of examples of this uh, as well, but OER really creates the use of OER, not just the OER itself, but it creates a shift in teaching practice and with an opportunities to meet instructor, instructional goals by the vetting and curating and the modifying uh, material approaches to students, um, both their personalized student needs and their interests. But even more important than that is the fact that if I'm a teacher and I'm modifying curriculum to my students, if I share that back into the commons, into the public good, then other people can build on that. So yeah, I'm a big recycler uh, at, at home. And 
so uh, this idea of how you take or reuse what you have and pass it on for others to personalize, whether it's about new exercises or a language uh, translation, whatever it is, how do we then share that back? There's more than enough educators around the world who are doing incredible work in their classrooms. Uh, we don't need to, it, it's not a big expense to have to build all of this curriculum. We can take what we have and then we can adapt it and build on it that way. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about open educational resources, uh, this has been around for a while. UNESCO actually defined the term OER back in 2002 uh, in Cape Town. Uh, the, it was an open education declaration that encouraged a set of strategies around building awareness of OER. This was in 2007, so this is 12 years ago. Uh, in 2014, there was a Paris OER declaration that provided a series of recommendations to educational stakeholders, and it really encouraged governments, so at the top level, to really create uh, policies around this. Up till then, so much of the emphasis was a very bottom-up approach, and uh, what we're seeing now, and as recently as uh, 2017, when the Second World OER Congress uh, was in Slovenia, that was sponsored by UNESCO, and it was about OER for inclusive and equitable quality education. Uh, and there were heads of ministries of education and a lot of other state leads that were really looking at this and saying this is an imperative. It's been very much tied to the Sustainable Development Goal uh, number four. For those of you who have memorized all 17, this is number four. And so there really is a, an emphasis on this now in a way worldwide that there hasn't been before. Um, just briefly, if we think about how OER supports student-centered learning, it is about equitable access. It's about uh, adapti uh, adaptability. It's about collaborative opportunities, as I mentioned, for educators to create, evaluate, share relevant and engaging learning experiences. And it's also about building and scaling the systems around continuous improvement and in innovation. Uh, my organization bill, has built an open educational resource library. It's like a public digital library. It's called OER Commons. I just put this out here as an example. There's many good libraries uh, around the world. Uh, we also help other people build their libraries for other states, organizations, and for ministries of education. Uh, and in fact, um, the gentleman from Austria this morning told you about one that was in Austria. So this is just one example. Um, just an example, we, we've done a lot of uh, research also in this field of OER, uh, and this was a project that we worked with librarians. We worked with about 100 librarians and asked them how they uh, create and curate content for their teachers, and this was both at the primary, secondary, as well as the higher ed level. And you can see it really is a process uh, that goes from collaboratively identifying the curriculum needs. Again, if we picked off where the last session left off uh, and thought, what are those curriculum needs for actually teaching mindfulness and empathy and compassion? Uh, the second stage was, and this was their process that they used, um, agreeing on a curriculum framework and curation goal. So this is taking that work and putting it into action. Um, being able to search and evaluate it for use, um, building the content and then aligning it to whatever kind of standards were important you know, in that context. So that might be curriculum standards, it might be quality standards, it might be compassion standards. Uh, the whole SEL uh, movement is also looking at how to define some standards around social emotional learning and can we create content that's aligned to those standards so when you want to use this materials in a classroom, you can say, I know that these are part of that um, process. Uh, and then, of course, this is very much of a design thinking process. So you share the content, you pilot it, you refine it, and you start all over again. So this, this continuous feedback loop is a really important part, and it's been almost non-existent in education in terms of curriculum. Uh, I know many schools in the U.S. and also around the world are using textbooks that are 20 plus years old. Uh, that's some pretty uh, static curriculum over time. Uh, it's also been exciting to watch some of this OER policy be created at the government level. Um, the Commonwealth of Learning reported that 55% of the countries uh, had, had been uh, increasing their support for OER policy. 
Um, like I mentioned, the UNESCO Sustainability Development Goal is a huge, is a very uh, strong initiative in the Education Division of UNESCO. And in the U.S., uh, under a prior administration, uh, there was a, an initiative called uh, Go Open, in which we already have commitments from 20 states and 120 districts to use uh, OER. Research on uh, OER has shown us that um, for educators who are using OER, it increased the collaboration around curriculum and instruction and also had uh, the educators themselves uh, an increase in their own reflective practice. So almost a reprofessionalization of their work. Instead of being told, here's what you teach on Thursday, here's what you test on Friday, what does it mean to actually put the, the concept of curriculum back into those experts who really understand their classrooms and their classroom needs better than anybody? For learners, uh, we've looked at how the use of OER has increased student uh, interest in their subject, um, satisfaction with the learning experience. Not surprisingly, when you see this, we often have students, both at the K-12 and the higher ed level, working with faculty uh, to create new curriculum. So maybe the, the faculty member will, will first present it that year, and by the end of that semester, students have themselves recommended how to improve the curriculum. So this is, again, very student-centered. Uh, uh, and not to mention that OER really supports students as self-directed learners as well, because this kind of content is available. Uh, there's, a, there's a big move towards something with commercial publishers uh, around digital, which is maybe you get your digital content on, a, on some tablet, but it's only available for that amount of time of the semester and then it's gone. So they say that this is free, uh, you know, freely available because it's on the tablet that you've already bought for the student, but in fact that really doesn't have, um, it doesn't have the spirit of open because it doesn't allow you to take that, to remix it, to distribute it, not to mention to have it over time. So um, this is me, uh, email me. I don't know if many people here are on Twitter. I've tried to find some of you there already. Uh, but what I wanna do next is um, I, all of the panelists beforehand actually provided a, a one or two pager about their talk today. And we took that, uh, all the text from that, and we put it in a word cloud, and here's what you get. So this is kind of a preview of what you're about to hear from the other four speakers. Um, you can see that, you know, personalized skills, capacity, experience, knowledge, you know, uh, independent, uh, student-centered, these are all sort of make up uh, kind of the body of what you're about to hear. I just want to leave you with some questions to be thinking about, both when you're um, listening to this next set of uh, panelists, but also um, just sort of in general as a kind of a framing for the conference here. And again, many of these things have been said already in the last two days, but you know, learning for what purpose, right? Is it a job? Is it critical thinking? Is it collaboration and communication? Uh, what changes need to be made to make materials better to reflect the communities that you serve? Uh, because what communities need in uh, you know, Cape Town, South Africa are gonna probably be different than what they need in Paris. So there's a lot of reasons for the personalization of content. Um, we, we hear this over and over again, how you make education relevant for today's learners, whether they're in formal or informal systems of education. And then I think a, a really big question that we have to be looking at is not only sort of how do we get the curriculum relevant to the global challenges that we face today, but why is education still so inaccessible to many? Uh, and what could we be doing to actually change that? So um, thank you. And I stayed within my 10 minutes, just so you know. And uh, I would like to first um, introduce um, Vani Sento, uh, who, and I'm not gonna spend any time introducing people. They can, in, they can say something about themselves as they want, but again, for the essence of time, we'll speed along here. My name is Vani Senter. I work as a researcher in Mother Service Society India, and I also work at a school uh, run by the Research Institute. The primary driver for education is the interest of the student and not the importance of the subject. 
a rigid curriculum is focused on training the students with abstract knowledge and technical skills. This system does not consider the needs and the interest of the person and leaves him unmotivated. An unmotivated child is not very participative and it's nearly impossible to educate them. Education is the collective wisdom gained from centuries of experience communicated to the future generations. But recently, due to technological and social evolutions, there is an incremental development of educational content and pedagogy. Also, this overload of information is available at our fingertips. It is high time now for us to realize that transfer of information is not the objective of education. Education must develop the person, his capacities, character, and personality so that he is equipped with life skills to reach his highest efficiency. We need a shift from imparting mere information to nurture thinking in the person. So we need to find out what are the nature of thinking and the nature of mind to understand this process. People construct knowledge from their experience. They learn something new by building on what they already know. All knowledge is self-referential. It is a continuous process of experience, reflection, and conceptualization. Personal relevance increases the student's motivation to learn engage in what is being taught and in retention and also in recall. We need a shift from a standardized mass education that tries to fit a person into a profile of profession to a personalized and customized education that meets the aspiration of the person. Each student learns differently. We must present the subject according to the learning capacities of the student. Presenting the content in pluralistic ways as visuals, audio, and hands-on experience is important to engage students with different learning faculties. Students have agency over learning when they are given a choice. This is very much achieved by le blended learning strategy, which has exponentially increased the capacity of teachers to deliver individualized instruction for each and every student. Blended learning is a model that combines online and face-to-face -face learning spaces. The online component is self-directed inquiry. The face-to-face -face interactions satisfy the need of the student for expert guidance, psychological and moral support from the teachers. Technology has provided unlimited resources allowing students to progress at their own pace based on the mastery of competencies. Educational institutions have partitioned knowledge into subjects and teach them in silos, losing focus on the whole. Narrow educational programs take students on an excursion to well-paid parts of theories and ask the students to replicate only the solution. This tourist experience is not sufficient to gain mastery. Students should be encouraged to question, explore, challenge, debate and rediscover knowledge for themselves rather than to memorize, accept, repeat what is taught. This will help them acquire skills that can be applied to any field. Creativity requires freedom to question established beliefs, prevailing theories, and conventional freedom. Wisdom. Learning is often constrained by the authority of those who teach and by the social acceptance of what has already been discovered. At its heart of knowledge, it's a process of end endless discovery for greater and greater knowledge rather than a set of orthodox th truths that are to be passed on and accepted religiously. We need a shift from respect for authority to the respect for the individual. In the past few decades, early childhood education has transformed immensely. Earlier, young children were harshly punished and they were deprived of love in the name of discipline. Maria Montessori designed a system that respects the freedom and choice of the child. Her students gain self-discipline by internalizing values and through mutual respect. Glenn Dorman gave simple rules to enhance memory. Follow the interest of the child. Stop teaching before the child wants to stop. Do not test them. These few methods, when applied, sustain the innate natural curiosity of the child. They motivated them to develop interest and passion for subjects. So all the principles that uh, we are discussing in the conference, even when they are implemented in small measures, they will bring out 
immense difference in the way the children are te treated. We talked about um, physical abuse or physical violence, but we are implement. Uh, we have not eliminated the emotional stress that has been given to students right now. In primary and secondary level of school education, project-based learning has been widely used as a teaching method. It incorporates transdisciplinary approach, overcoming the silos of disciplines, but our obsession with measuring has made these approaches mechanistic. While assessment and evaluation measure progress and identify weak spots, they also stifle personal growth and they create a stressful environment. We are measuring quantifiable skills only. Creativity and genius cannot be measured and we need to wait until they manifest as achievements in the life of the students. As discussed in the uh, earlier panels, World Health Organization reports that students are more stressed than ever. Increased workloads and social media use could be contributing to the fact that the number of students dying by suicide has almost doubled in just over a decade. The well-being of the student must be at the heart of education. We need to learn how to live happily and harmoniously as an individual and as a responsible contributor to the progress of society. I work as a math coach at the primary and secondary level of a school. So the questions that we often hear from students are, why are we learning this? Mm -hmm. Is it really necessary that I learn how to solve quadratic equation and how to calculate square root when I can easily use a calculator? Is it really necessary that I have to draw the graph by hand because there are so many tools that are available easily. So we are incorporating many hands-on experiences and bringing out change in which math education has been followed for several years. Teaching formula and procedures is replaced by activities and discussions that develop, num that develop number sense. Number sense is a way of relating numbers concretely and visually so that the abstract notion of numbers becomes real to the student. Pluralistic way of teaching, offering a choice to the student, validating the thinking process and not just the result, they have all brought major difference in the attitude of the learner. Unless students see the purpose of learning and its real world implication, they will not be an active learner. We have also observed that skipping new teaching models in any leg of school education does not bring any positive result at all. So if we don't teach these new methods in kindergarten level, we cannot expect the same result at the primary level. If we skip them and we teach only these integrated methods in secondary school level, we cannot expect the same levels. We have to implement all the tools at each level. Stanford University established purposeful learning in 2014. Students declared mission, not a major, like I am learning human biology to el eliminate human hunger. I'm learning computer science and political science to rebuild how citizens engage with governments. This purposeful learning was implemented to couple disciplinary pur pursuit with the purpose that fueled it. Alumni, alumni of this type of teaching method reported that their missions have become a compass that guided their career. They have an endless list of contributions to eliminate poverty, bring uh, better welfare, etc. And this kind of clarity of purpose, experience creating impact along with mastery of subject matter has been a key to their success. I'd like to conclude that by saying, education must develop independent mind capable of making conscious value judgments and act on deeper convictions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> David Skalmani, yes. yes. Thank you, Vani, to you know, bringing out those pieces around student agency and competencies and active learning. I think we're going to see that thread come through here as we, as we hear from our other presenters today. So thank you, Lisa. I'm David Scalmani. I am the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Cairo, Egypt. I cover the same position here in Belgrade, so I'm back to <laughs> where I've been uh, at least uh, until two, two months ago. Uh, but in my previous capacity, I, uh, I was uh, a lecturer uh, of Italian language 
um, sent by the Italian government uh, through uh, different places in the world. So I had the opportunity to be involved in uh, different uh, national education systems in South Korea, Mexico, and so forth. And I've seen uh, the space of the student-centered approach growing in those 20 years. But some conditions have to be met. Um, and I speak first about responsibilities, a double responsibility. Um, successful student-centered approach is based on the fact the student is responsible for learning. He cannot shift the responsibility to someone else. He is responsible. That, that is the deep meaning of being centered on student. But at the same time, the teacher is responsible for facilitating the learning. So we, without those, those two responsibilities, I don't think we can go on with the student-centered approach. And of course, uh, the knowledge transmission paradigm is replaced by the competence, as Lisa said, learning paradigm founded on cooperative learning and inductive methods, we have discussed them about. Uh, they, they include a wide range of active methodologies, uh, inquiry-based learning, learning case-based case instruction, problem-based learning, and so forth. But they are basically derived from the theories of pragmatic pedagogy. And I would add the humanistic approach. The, the professor before from the Faculty of Arts, she uh, advocated for the presence of artists here in the panel, and I totally agree. I would add another, another suggestion for the next uh, conference. Uh, ask to uh, historian of pedagogy to be here, and a philosophy of education to be here. They have so many insights in what we are we, had, we have been talking about. And uh, we, we've been talking about uh, the Leonardo case, and we, we said, well, it's not about creativity. So what is all about if it's not creativity? Because creativity is 24 hours, seven, we, we are all creative. Maybe we don't know, and we have to study more about the school that Leonardo attended. Hmm. Do you know which school attended Leonardo? It's the same school that was attended by Sandro Botticelli, Pietro Perugino, Domenico Ghirlandaio, Luca Signorelli. I mentioned, I think, four or five of the best artists, scientist artists, because the, that, that distinction was not clear at that time, of course. They all have been schooled by one master, Andrea del Verrocchio. So it has something to do with school, even for a genius, as we are usually uh, uh, defining those personality, which doesn't define anything. If, you, if we say that someone is a genius, we, we just give a pattern to them, but there's no explanation on it. So history of pedagogy uh, teaches, us, teaches us a lot of things. In the Italian tradition, we had in 21st century, Maria Montessori, up to Loris Malaguzzi, very much focused on the uh, primary education, even uh, kindergarten and so forth. But we can mention, of course, the French, the French uh, uh, tradition, uh, Celestin Frenet and others. A basic assumption of, of all those uh, uh, um, pedagogists is that the learner's mind is embedded in an individual body, which is actually a person, and was mentioned before, by Professor Zucconi, the importance of uh, the person-centered uh, uh, education. And, and persons, uh, of course, are uh, uh, in relation uh, with the social dimensions. Uh, so parents, family, socialization issues, peer group, all those things that usually stays, stay out of the, of the classroom. And persons, persons have uh, several levels of needs, um, basic needs, uh, more developed needs, and, and I have uh, I've seen the presentation before mentioning human flourishing. And that's a need too, we have to take into account that. So that's the level of the intervention that the student-centered approach should, should reach. Um, student-centered education empowers the students to take ownership of what they learn by focusing on how the new knowledge solves the problems 
solves problems or adds value. Instead of simply trying to hammer information into the child's mind and asking illegitimate questions, the teacher as facilitator presents the student with an issue and guides the class as they build the solution. Uh, illegitimate questions, that's a definition that I got from uh, Heinz von Furster. Uh, he uh, was a scientist cybernetics. He founded the second order cybernetics. And, uh, and I think illegitimate questions, uh, maybe the definition is, is very simple, uh, um, are questions of which we already know the answer. So probably 99% of the questions that have been, that have been raised in, in, the normal, in, a, in a normal classroom are illegitimate questions. And why are they illegitimate? Because they trivialize human beings. It's such a trivial thing to, for me to ask a question to a pupil, to a student, of which I already know the answer. It's totally demotivating. We are asking uh, to transform a human being into an input-output machine. No motivation in that. I, I don't find, and, and even more now, uh, we have a, a extended uh, knowledge base, very accessible. Why would we ask question whose, whose answer we already know? Uh, then, that's a student-centered approach. Ask only legitimate questions. Questions that we don't know exactly the answer. Big questions, we, we, have, we have seen that before, the, the, the SDGs goals. They are all questions, we don't know the answer exactly, but we can build knowledge uh, using our resources, using our minds, using uh, uh, the person that uh, the, the classroom are, are made of. And um, at the, at, I'm speaking now about the Italian system, uh, which is, in the last 20 years, uh, being influenced by the European Union recommendation, uh, which have been focused uh, on uh, the competencies. And competencies, I think it's a good compromise, uh, uh, given the fact that the system, uh, they, we have national systems, of course, and we have to harmonize the system in the European Union. But the thing is, if we don't find a way to communicate, to transfer the knowledge from one system to the other, it, it, it's going to be uh, uh, very complicated to, to go on at the European level. So competencies are uh, actually uh, a, a, a clever way to overcome the problem of uh, non-transferable uh, knowledge. And, and we have also competencies as the end of process of education uh, based on, uh, of course, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So the three level uh, that, compone, that compose the, the uh, education action as the European Union have seen it. One problem, Italian problem, uh, the, the, the decision makers level is very well aware of the necessity to, ch to shift to the, to the competencies uh, based education. The teachers are not that, uh, are not so happy to accept uh, the, new, the new model and just uh, I've found a way, a very clever way, to walk around the suggestion, the recommendation of the European Union and the national, and the national authorities. What, did, what, what have they done? They have stick to their disciplinary uh, subject. And they have just rewritten it in a competence-based formula so that they can teach as they are used to be, but they can show to the, uh, to the headmaster or to the supervisor that, that, they, can, that they have just, uh, 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 well, they have adjusted to, to what was uh, asked to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I re remember as a, as a faculty member myself, as a professor, my students were very unhappy when I asked them a question and I said, I don't know. Um, and so I, I think there's a shift that has to happen, not only of the student taking responsibility for their learning, you know, but it's a, a, among the, the professor or teacher as well to admit that 
And that's a shift, that's another shift because you also don't want your dean saying, well, that, that professor doesn't know what they're talking about, right? So there is a whole kind of social, uh, you know, context that needs to be shifted as well. Thank you so much. Um, Pericles, Mit Mitkas? Hello, everybody. Uh, I am a professor of uh, computer engineering at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. I was, uh, up until uh, August, uh, the rector of the university. And now I'm on uh, sabbatical at the University of uh, Pennsylvania in the US. I'm uh, also the president of the Black Sea University Network, a uh, network of about 115 universities, uh, including the University of Belgrade. Uh, in 12 countries around the Black Sea uh, region. Uh, so with uh, that background, um, I have uh, some experience to talk about uh, the subject, but uh, Lisa Petri uh, Petridis made me realize that uh, my perspective is uh, limited to higher education, and that uh, this is true. So towards a student-centered education, towards a student-centered higher uh, education, uh, I should correct uh, myself. So um, uh, the audience uh, in higher education are uh, the millennials, um, a generation uh, born around the beginning of uh, uh, the century. And uh, they have uh, distinct uh, characteristics uh, because this is the first generation that was born in uh, uh, the digital world. Uh, they uh, uh, are ethnically and racially diverse because people move uh, around uh, much more uh, often. Uh, they are uh, more progressive, uh, the most uh, tech advanced, advanced uh, generation uh, ever. They not only use technology, but they're willing, and they are doing it, uh, uh, they're willing to advance it uh, as well. They believe education uh, through technology is a big factor to achieve in success in life. And uh, this is true for the majority of uh, young people uh, today, uh, which uh, see themselves as global citizens eager to contribute to the welfare of uh, society and, uh, and the world. Uh, and they take on uh, uh, social uh, issues, uh, and they have they, they take a stand. Uh, they learn foreign languages. They interact. They travel much easier, much uh, on a, on a moment's uh, notice. Uh, and this is especially true for uh, uh, areas like the European, uh, like Europe, European Union, and uh, and. Um, uh, the U.S. So all, the, all these uh, characteristics make them uh, want flexibility in their uh, education uh, as well. They believe that the answer and the path uh, to success is uh, education, so we have to uh, deliver. Uh, a few years back, actually five years back, I was attending one of those uh, mega conferences in, in Brussels on innovation, uh, innovation convention. Thousands of people in uh, uh, sessions, and there was, of course, one session on uh, uh, innovation on education. Uh, opened by Chris Patton of Barnes, the Chancellor of Oxford University, with a, a huge experience in other positions to um, he defended the uh, large educational institutions like his university. Uh, back then, MOOCs were uh, uh, a, a, a trendy thing, so he uh, uh, specifically said uh, universities will not be mooked down. Um, we have nothing to fear if we uh, pro continue to provide quality education. Interestingly enough, the next speaker to him was Anne-Marie Maffidon. Then, uh, I think, uh, I believe he was, she was about 20 years old. Uh, she had uh, just received a, a master's in mathematics, the youngest female student at her 19th uh, years of age to, uh, to receive uh, uh, such a degree, a genius. So she said, we want to be able to learn anything, anytime, anywhere, 
at our pace, at our place. <laughs> and of course, this strategy will work for geniuses. Uh, the average student may want or may need a more structured uh, uh, program of study, some, uh, some guidance, but it is true that students come better prepared, better educated uh, to, to college. And they have the ability to learn from many different uh, sources outside or besides in parallel to, uh, to class. Technology uh, makes uh, all these uh, uh, modes of, of learning uh, possible. So technology is good for education because it uh, generates uh, an, an environment where uh, knowledge is accessible, ubiquitous, abundant, uh, at the, uh, our fingertip, coming on a display of a uh, small or medium or large uh, device. New devices, new tools, new platforms for, for learning uh, everywhere. And of course, it uh, comes with uh, some risks, uh, uh, like we are more machine dependent for every uh, piece of, uh, of knowledge. We don't uh, uh, memorize uh, anything uh, anymore. Uh, we can no, I mean, kids or students can no longer uh, remember the big dates of history or places of, of, of history. And we consider it uh, a deficiency. Probably it's not. Uh, many phases of, uh, of education uh, have uh, been uh, discussed uh, in, uh, in this conference uh, and uh, in other conferences on, on education, um, distant learning, lifelong learning, uh, e-learning, e uh, MOOCs, uh, webinars, uh, and they make, uh, they enable what I call the multiple windows to student-centered uh, ed education, um, in which mobility transferability of uh, learning experiences and uh, virtual reality uh, make this flexible, lifelong uh, learning uh, a, a reality. Um, I don't think I need to give uh, definitions to flexible uh, learning, but I get uh, students, uh, as I said, I teach in a five-year uh, uh, combined a bachelor's and master's the, uh, diploma of engineering program that requires students to take about 60 classes. They're all science and engineering. And yet there are students who take an additional 10 MOOCs from uh, uh, places like uh, Stanford or, or, or MIT uh, to uh, add on to their, uh, to their curriculum. I had a student uh, who uh, came to me last year with a topic, uh, students have to do a, a thesis, a diploma thesis uh, in their final semester. So a student came to me with a, a, a subject for his thesis, which was so advanced that even after he finished it, I'm, st I'm still not certain I understand the, uh, the, uh, the, f uh, the f whole thing. He had gone to uh, Montreal and worked to, uh, with a machine learning uh, research center, a famous machine learning uh, research center, and he came back with, uh, with all that uh, knowledge. So students, in, uh, especially in computer science, computer engineering, they, they may know more than uh, what we uh, know as, uh, as, uh, as teachers. And uh, a, a, another example is, is the course that I have to teach uh, next semester in, uh, at, the at UPenn. It's a mas machine learning on, uh, uh, for life sciences. I'm fascinated and terrified at the same time because uh, it's a subject that will allow me to learn and teach new things that uh, uh, were discovered in the last uh, five or six years, but uh, I may have uh, students who know more than I do in the, in, in the class. What do I do? So all these, do they uh, signal the end of traditional university as we know it? Not really, of course, but micromasters, nano degrees, one of classes, specialization are all justifiable. Should we follow the others in the business uh, rather than copying Stanford or MIT? Uh, we should ask, what does my institution do better than any other? Where do we have the expertise? And then focus on that and avoid uh, a situation where local universities will uh, simply become educational service providers uh, for, uh, for other countries. Uh, this is certainly the case 
in Greece, where we see a lot of our graduates leave out of the country. This is certainly the case for, uh, for Serbia and other, other uh, uh, countries uh, in the world. Um, several uh, concepts will shape the future of education during the next uh, 20 years, but they all uh, can be summed up to uh, flexibility. And uh, these are 10 characteristics of student-centered experiences. Uh, rather than analyzing all of them, I will repeat uh, going um, uh, uh, from uh, upper uh, left corner uh, counterclockwise. Anytime, anywhere, feedback from my partners in learning, students can get that. All of my artifacts as a student are archived in shared multimedia records, open uh, education uh, records, like Lisa Petridis uh, said. All of the world's thinkers are connected to me and I can uh, gain from their uh, collective knowledge. And all of the world's knowledge uh, is at my fingertips. Uh, I will uh, part you with two disturbing thoughts. Uh, Brain machine interface. It will be a major disruptor to education, especially higher education. There is progress in all fronts. We don't know how this is going to evolve, and we don't know how uh, the brain will be able to download some information and knowledge from uh, uh, from the machine, from uh, the computer. And the second disturbing thought is uh, we in this conference and similar conferences, we can all talk the talk, we can all analyze the situation. Uh, I doubt if any one of us, and with uh, uh, the exception of those uh, who are younger, below 40, 45 years of age, I doubt if any one of us can walk the walk. I doubt if any one of us can imagine the class without a teacher. Nobody can take ourselves uh, out of the uh, out of the picture, but that's what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pericles. And I just, uh, you know, the idea that uh, we can be skilled facilitators and actually teach any, help a student learn any subject, I think is something, uh, Vanya, you certainly said as well. If the teacher now becomes facilitator, knowing everything more than your students know isn't actually the goal. It's how do you facilitate that student learning? So, no, no, but, I know, but sorry, you still a, have to be in the class. Absolutely, yes. In the class. <laughs> so, um, so last, Jovan Despotovic from uh, Serbia here. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, I am very much satisfied having you in Belgrade <laughs> because we need all kinds of pushing for the best for the best future or the better future because of the history that you know at first place we have to we have to uh, recollect our position that strategic planning for the education of the future is the major point that i would like to emphasize because in ex socialist states or republics we lost a lot of planning skills, planning abilities, and we are running, trying to uh, catch the pace and catch the goals that all of the other developed countries already did. So, this is my major concern. In regard to education and within the strategic and strategy of the nation, this can be a most important place for education. Uh, a realistic national strategy should be based on knowledge, on knowledge from all levels in the country and also in the wider society, like is Europe or the world. And also UNESCO offers a numerous uh, experience and uh, case studies for many, many of the questions that we have, including education. Uh, Major directions in future education should be based uh, in that way that improvement of both physical and mental health of the society and each of us 
will be above all. I would also like to remind you that healthy people, a healthy society and a healthy culture in clear environment, which I will repeat several times today, could come in very traditional and modern education basis. Also, there are a lot of challenges from the cyber world. I don't want to list some, any of those, but there are so a lot of threats altogether. Uh, networking is one of the possible solutions for development of education in poor and not developed countries. That's my major uh, concern since I've been representing half of the world in UNESCO uh, International Hydrological Committee for four years. And I've been visiting from Mexico and Canada all the way to Central Asia and ex-Soviet republics. And I found that their education, their basic education, is not that bad. But they are trying to jump over the wide and deep gap which was for decades in those areas, which means half or maybe more than half of the world need some dramatic changes of education, which all of us would be very much happy to see. And so not only the developed world, but also the developing world should be, should be having in mind all of this stuff. Uh, in addition to that, modern solutions in society and above all the environment, I told you that I would be repeating this stuff, should be individually, individually tailored. Uh, river by river, lake by lake, uh, position, uh, location <clears throat> by location. And this is that the way that we can attract young people, solving the problems in environment and societies. So it makes even more complicated and difficult our position as educators and scholars. Uh, in this regard, in must, I must repeat, poor and, and, uh, and developing countries, we must find people, predominantly students and even pupils, who are ready to serve the national strategy, not only of uh, IT sector or business sector, but also environment sector and education sector. Those should be elite. Those should be privileged people in the way that they are going to try to pursue professions in this regard. Otherwise, decreasing the position of educators, teachers, scholars, professors, all together will lead to a much poorer society altogether. This is my major concern of this presentation and this topic at all. So, uh, the best students and champions in any of the fields of human activities should be chosen, supported by all means, financially, in any other way, in all of the parts of the world that I mentioned, not repeat. In that way, we can rally on them in the next next future, in the future education and development and all. Last but not the least, I would like to remind you that if people do not change and adapt to nature, the nature will respond in much more dramatically ways. In this moment, I will connect what was discussed about the art and the science and education and just remind you that Hokusai, famous painter from Japan, had a painted a big wave. It's a very famous his painter. A couple of decades before the big wave that had happened in Phuket and in Fukushima. So there is a very tiny line, if there is any, between anticipation our forecasting using mathematics and all kinds of, of, of probability theory and art. So this is one, uh, one point. The other point is that 
the only people, a group of people that saved their lives in Phuket was the group of tourists from a hotel where a small girl was uh, annoying and screaming at those people who were very much eager to see where the sea disappeared, running toward the hill. So knowledge, and knowledge is the only thing that we can rally on in the future. Last but not the least, I think that, again, I think that major demanding positions for employing of people will be the three categories of, 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 of people or, or, or domains that we are not facing with, lot of, with, with enough uh, caution. Small children are very much jeopardized by new technologies. Very old people, we don't have concept for the very old people, and again, environment. Thank you very much. Well, let's just take um, uh, just a couple minutes for questions, maybe five minutes. I know that they're gonna uh, cut lunch down a little bit, and we, 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 so I think we have five minutes for questions or comments. I'd love if you could keep your question or comment to you know, maybe a minute or so, so we can hear th from three or four of you. Um, you know, certainly some of the questions that arise as I, as I listen to the panel is, you know, why aren't we doing more of this? Or how realistic is this? Do we have enough time, right? Can we wait a generation of, teach, of uh, you know, teaching uh, third graders? Do we have enough time that they'll be critical thinkers in 15 years, right? I think we've certainly heard that the urgency of this. Um, anyway, those are just some of the things that are, that are kind of brewing in my mind as I listen to everybody, but would love to hear, again, if you have some comments, is this realistic what you've heard? You've heard, I think, both the caution of what we're up against as well as some ideas for how this should be. How, how realistic is that, for example? But anything, is, anything goes. And as I like to say when I was teaching, you can't be wrong. So whatever you're thinking, uh, go ahead and. Yes. Thank you. Regarding the stress that students have due to evaluation and admission in colleges, I was just wondering if there is some way that that stress can be removed. Would uh, collaborative learning, gamification, could technology be used to remove the stress? Could project-based learning? Because uh, in India where I come from, this, this pressure to get admission in schools and colleges to get a job, or to get this much of marks, scores, this is so great that it would be wonderful if this pressure could be removed in some way. Could technology do it? Could some other traditional way do this? Just a comment basically, yeah. but it would be great if we had ideas that could be implemented. Yes. I think schools in general are supposed to do a very good job. By the other hand, we can see that really great guys like uh, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, and <clears throat> Bill Gates, and many others, they, did go to, they went to college and dropped out or didn't go to college. So what really we are preparing are average people or we are really nurturing di different people to make a difference in this planet. Because Steve Jobs was a dro dropout. He went to school and said, this, this, uh, this does not make sense. It's very bad. You know? And uh, he changed the planet. The same, like, like uh, Bill Gates and others. So we train people to be average, or we really want to, 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 to educate people to change the planet. 
Uh, so I'd like to just make a quick response to that. I don't know if anybody else wants to say something, but uh, so first of all, somebody like Steve Jobs, you know, he, he also did a lot of informal education. He spent time in India. He uh, learned to meditate. You know, we we're talking about mindfulness uh, recently, uh, earlier today. So there's some things like that that I think are important to keep in mind. Uh, also, we say this, you know, in the US, that those examples you gave are in fact white men uh, in a society where they could get by and pass by not having that kind of education, whereas certainly people of color or people who come from a lower class have a, a much more difficulty in, in sort of doing that same thing. So you may have some very creative brilliance among other people who are never gonna, so, so yes, those are remarkable uh, human beings that you just mentioned, but what did we miss by those who didn't, who weren't um, able to sort of get into those sort of, those doors would have been closed to them without the kind of education that they needed. Even, even Einstein had difficult to go to college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his father thought he was crazy. Yes. <laughs> even his father, and it was difficult to, to pass the entrance examination. Mm -hmm. And then that's, of course, learning disabilities. Yes, you wanted to say? Please. If I may, you should educate people for the goals. Can you give him the mic here? Excuse me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if I may add, you should educate people for both. For the average, basic knowledge, for everyday practice, but also to give opportunity to talents, to change our education, to improve our education by networking, by making all of the stuff they can start at 10 or 11 or 12 years, in young ages. Yes, did you, Pericles, want to come with Well, us? I wanted to say that uh, as I uh, already done in my, uh, with my example with uh, uh, the young lady uh, uh, who is a mathematical genius, Steve Jobs, uh, and all these people are outliers. There are specific uh, cases, one in a million perhaps. Which, uh, should we build our education system with uh, those people uh, in mind? As uh, Spodovic uh, said, uh, let them do, let everybody do whatever they want, but uh, the, the education system has to be uh, structured for the average, you can call them average, but uh, uh, the average would be 95% uh, of, uh, of the people. Yeah, that would be the average. So, no, go no, ahead. No, no, so, well, Alberto, well, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for a wonderful panel. Uh, I caught something like uh, what we're going to do <laughs> as a teacher or professor. I think uh, there is a, a sort of, we all, you know, trying to improve education. And I see. Uh, if it's not truly people-centered education, uh, it's going to fail. If it's only student-centered education, we miss the point. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that uh, we need uh, effective promotion of change, the social construction, and to consider that teachers, <coughs> professors, are the victim uh, of uh, obsolete form of education. And to blame the teacher to be mechanistically oriented is not going to help us uh, to get out of the problem. Actually, it's going to reinforce the problem. I suggest uh, that uh, when we promote change, uh, we include uh, all the stakeholders, even the families, uh, uh, into you know, joining to improve uh, not only the single people, but uh, also the social dimension of social health, uh, of social knowledge, uh, so people can be more productive, uh, but they are, if they are productive uh, in their community. So also the pedagogy, what kind of vision we have of the person. If we see the person uh, ending up uh, with their skin, uh, we something uh, really obsolete. <laughs> it's mechanicistic and reductionistic. To be able to bring uh, effective student education, education should not uh, just include the students, but the people and the community. Thank you. Did you have one more comment, Debbie? No, uh, this might be the last comment. No, no, b b back to the, the Steve Jobs uh, <laughs> problem. Uh, 
let's not forget that in the iPhone that we have in our pocket, there's more than 100 patents that are the result of public funded researches in public universities. And even internet is a creation of the CERN, public funded scientific institute. So uh, they are of course very, those people are very able to uh, use the tools to build the companies and, and so forth, but without uh, the university research, without the basic uh, scientific knowledge, they would not have done anything. And I might just also, as an open advocate, say that uh, with open access, then those kinds right. of patents aren't locked in to a, uh, uh, you know, into a uh, multinational corporation's uh, revenue, but in fact are shared and used throughout by whoever wants to use those in whatever country. So interesting that publicly funded research ends up in, you know, being a com bought by a commercial vendor who the public gets no benefit. Not never mind taxes. I don't know. Did you? Somebody talked about Jeff Bezos. We just came out that they paid like no tax. Amazon paid no taxes last year. So anyway, just keep that in mind too. One more comment from anybody. Anybody want the closing comment? You want the closing comment? It has to be good. <laughs> I'm not, I was listening only partly, but I think it is a very interesting session. It is very clear that one had to address the student. Now, when we see and analyze worldwide, what are the students who get the best prices? I'm only talking about university level, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, who get the best prices, the prices, student prices worldwide. And we made the analysis during the last 10 years which student got that. And it seems that those students who received the prices are number one, where the professor was excellent and was able to transfer the knowledge to the students. There are many professors, more than 50% of the professors at universities are teaching and doesn't understand the subject themselves. So it's very difficult if you don't understand it yourself to transfer it to the student. That is one. And the second one that is that the students of a number of schools, I talk here again about excellent schools. If you take MIT, the transfer is mainly from student to student. They work on the same projects. And it is then also the professor is influencing, but mainly the students themselves. We also see that, and an analysis was made at Max Planck Institute in Germany, it was mainly the students who were teaching the students. It was the communication to students. And the last point I would like to mention here is that I understood that professor or rector from the University of Thessalonica very nice place, very nice university. And I met him already with such speech of the director of the project. It is a European project, by the way. The project is about the uh, uh, electronics and so on. It's very nice uh, to have that. But uh, yeah, it has been also analyzed in detail on a European level. And it seems that there is no really uh, uh, a breakthrough in all that one. It is clear that the um, internet and so on is very nice and there are extremely nice programs which have been launched by MIT years back that students are learning on that. But still, there are a number of dangers and disadvantages. First of all, you must have a kind of a degree is always, if you apply for a job, they really say, well, in your curriculum vitae, who are you? What have you studied? Where have you studied? What have you doing? Now, in the case of the so-called the electronic learning, the problem of the diploma is quite a, a difficult problem. It is not really a recognized, although that it might be in some cases a good, a high level diploma what you are giving, but it, if it is not recognized by some bodies, the people cannot really use it. So I think it is still a little bit of uh, yeah, the, the danger. Uh, if it, it seems that from the analysis what we received, 
area. I've not made it, but I've seen the analysis on a European basis. It really seems that it is good for excellent students. It's very difficult for other students. And study is not only a superficial. Study must be in your body, must be in your blood. You must, if you know a subject, you have it in your blood. If you have it in your blood, then it is okay. And it seems that it's difficult to get from the electronics to get it into the blood from the people. That's more so or less a little bit of the experience I have. I could really send you a lot of documents as I have the advantage that I receive a number of documents, a number of analyses who have been made worldwide in the field of education, university, that was my main interest, but also on other fields. And I think uh, it would be, one has to address it to the student, but the student, he should leave the classroom and he should understand it. So I, I would I like to, can I ask you to, you made some great points and I would love to be able to talk about these at lunch. We just got the, uh, the, the, uh, the hand wave from the door open. So thank you very much. Um, but the Greek in me says we must eat now. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>